Uh, it's an enormous pleasure to be here. This is an extremely okay. distinguished okay. audience. Uh, Gary is one of the most famous taskmasters in Berlin. <laughs> I'm more dead than alive after these meetings. <laughs> I don't know how to go on, um, but I am revived by the sheer animation and, um, and uh, distinction of my German counterparts. And some of you are here tonight, and I thank you for coming. Susanna and I love Berlin. We love being here. Um, this is a room of full of famous and distinguished people who have accomplished enormous amounts. Some of the fellows are uh, famously distinguished. I, I don't think it's invidious of me, however, uh, if I single out Alfred Brendel. Uh, Alfred, I think I speak for everybody in the room when we pay testimony to what we've all learned over 40, 50, sometimes 60 years from this man's playing. Uh, I, when I think of what um, truth in music is, I think of Alfred Brendel, and it's an honor to have you here tonight. <laughs> it's also an honor for me to be the Richard Holbrook Fellow. Um, I knew Richard um, not very well, but I accompanied him in one of those hilarious, slightly panic-inducing trips that he would take when he did diplomacy as jazz, that is, diplomacy as constant improvisation. In 1998, he said to me, why don't you come to Turkey with me? So I got on a plane and went to what I thought was Turkey. And then we got to Istanbul, and he said, I think we'll go to Athens. So we went to Athens. I couldn't figure out why we were going to Athens, but we saw the American ambassador, and silent conversations went on with the American ambassador. And then he said, I think we're going to go to Belgrade. And we went to Belgrade, and <laughs> I began to get a sense that something was going on. And we got into the plane to go to Frankfurt, and he suddenly said, I think we're going to Pristina. And this was in the eve, this was December 1998, when he was improvising attempts to force um, an alternative to uh, war in the Balkans for the second time. And he was uh, infuriating, he was manipulative, he was deceptive, and he was, um, uh, in his way, a genius. I, I, I say that with care. Uh, you shouldn't overuse that word, especially when you've got a genius in the room. Um, and what I admired about him tremendously was his Again, I want to use this word in the right way, his promiscuity. That is, he mm -hmm. took advice from everybody. He was interested in what artists had to say. He was interested in what journalists had to say. He manipulated journalists shamelessly, but listened <laughs> carefully to what they said. Uh, he was no respecter of persons. He would, he would suck up information from everybody he met, from the driver who was taking him to a meeting. And th that, that hunger for information, that avidity for life, was an enormous personal strength. And it's why when he died, people said, said not merely that an important public figure had died, they had a sense of personal loss. I had a sense of personal loss, and I didn't even know him very well. So it's a matter of, of um, some emotion to me to lecture in the place that he had did so much to set up. I mean, this, this place is, in some sense, not just the house that Gary built, but also the house that Richard built. And that's a wonderful thing to think about, to leave a great institution behind. And I want to use my, my time, and I hope we'll have time for a vigorous discussion, to essentially talk about a subject that was very dear to Holbrook's heart, which is intervention. And to look at the history of intervention from the 90s through to 2013, bookended by the failure to intervene successfully in Somalia in 1993, the failure to intervene in Rwanda in 1994, the successful intervention in Kosovo and, and uh, in Bosnia in 1995, the successful intervention in, in uh, Kosovo, the catastrophe of Iraq, the um, slow-moving catastrophe of Afghanistan, Libya, Mali, and now Syria. Uh, I want to think about what we've learned about intervention through that very difficult cycle, which is most of my kind of adult life. In, and uh, not only think about uh, intervention, but also think about what it tells us about sovereignty. 
what, it, what this last 20 years tells us about the world we, we live in. Uh, the last 20 years have seen extraordinary changes which none of us could have predicted. I think we all thought, or I certainly bought into, um, if not the end of history, the triumph of democratic capitalism at the end of the Cold War, and we have now passed into a world that I think almost nobody anticipated in 1991 or 1992, uh, the passing of the 1945 order, um, the relative decline of the United States as a provider of global public goods, the relative decline of the United Nations and of global governance, um, the rise of authoritarian capitalism, the rise of two huge spoilers and free riders in the international system, Russia and China, who between them account for a very large number of the human race. Um, the emergence of, of India, South Korea, Brazil, South Africa, the rise of new powers. This really is the end of the 1945 dispensation, the end of the Cold War period which we thought would live forever. Uh, and on top of all these changes, um, I think a slow and ongoing crisis of democratic sovereignty in Europe. Uh, all of this is an unexpected landscape. Uh, it would, I think, uh, have surprised any of us if anybody had predicted these things in 1993 at the beginning of our, of our period. Um, and I want to say something about what this tells us about... Uh, about sovereignty. One of the, the things I see uh, when I look out at this transformation of the world in the last 20 years has been a, a transformation in the, in, in the idea of sovereignty and in some sense a crisis in the capacities of sovereign states which we need to think about. If you think about what sovereignty is, it's mastery in your own house. Hmm. Uh, I'm a sovereigntist because I'm a Democrat, because I used to be a politician, because I love the idea of being able to promise to your people you'll be masters in your own house. You don't need to submit to the world as an experience of fate. We care about politics and we care about democratic politics because we think it gives us mastery of our fate, mastery of our house. And I think uh, after the end of the Cold War, we succumb to a certain fiction about globalization being compatible with that sense of mastery in our own house. Uh, and I think what has been, uh, and, and with the globalization that occurred after the end of the Cold War, we saw uh, the deregulation of markets, the privatization of industries, uh, the liberalization of markets. Um, sovereigns did that to reduce the hold of the sovereign on the market. And then I think we've had an almighty surprise from 2008 onwards. The sudden sense that globalized markets could threaten the capacity of sovereign states to master their own destiny, master their own house. If you were in politics as I was through the economic crisis, that was the fear that you saw in the eyes of your fellow citizens. You go to a small manufacturing town in southwestern Ontario, not the hardest hit place in the world by any means, and you'd see fear in the eyes of your fellow citizens. Is there a bottom under our feet? Uh, will these jobs ever come back? Will our destiny ever be in our hands, or has it passed to global shapers of labor markets, global shapers of capital markets, over which democratic sovereigns no longer have control. And that seems to me to remain not only for the, we, we tend to think that the crisis of democratic sovereignty is a crisis only for the poor, weak, straggling brethren, for Ireland or for Spain or for uh, Italy or for Greece. I don't think there's a democratic sovereign state in the world that is now free of that fear. Uh, even the United States, it seems to me, is for the first time in its history uh, as a dominant power, facing up to the enormous power of free capital markets and free markets in labor and the implications that has for sovereign democracy and sovereign control. And I see uh, 
if I can be normative and prescriptive here, I see only one way out of this, which is a reassertion of sovereign control over markets, um, a, a re-regulation of markets, uh, a, an, an attempt really to regain democratic control uh, for the sake of the legitimacy of the democratic system itself. Um, I think anybody who was in public office during the too big to fail era felt real fear. The idea that people could come to a Hank Polson, Secretary of the Treasury, and basically in the politest way take out a pistol and say, you either save me or we're all going down. That's a terrible, terrible place for a great republic to be placed in. That's a terrible place. You never want to go back there. So one of the stories I want to tell you tonight is that if you think about this 20 years, um, it's revealed the immense fragility of democratic sovereignty and, in my view, underscore the tremendous importance of democratic sovereigns regaining uh, sufficient control over the markets to give ordinary citizens what they absolutely have to have in the modern world, a sense that they are masters of their own house and not playthings of vast impersonal forces. So if you, if you start thinking about intervention, about going to foreign places and fixing other people's problems, I think we started the 1990s with a slightly condescending view that the problem with sovereignty was in weak and failing and failed states out there. And what I'm saying is trying to flip this around and make you see the extent to which the crisis of sovereignty is actually felt very close to home. And it's eroded our confidence in our politics, and we need to get it, we need to get it back. Uh, and I hope we'll talk about that uh, later. That's some initial thoughts about sovereignty. Let me talk a little bit about what we learned about intervention in, in the 90s, uh, in the heyday when we took our sovereignty for granted, in the heyday when we took our capacity to right wrongs for granted, uh, in, the day, in the heyday of um, uh, what I think could only be called sovereign hubris. Um, right from the beginning, we learned some tough lessons, and we've forgotten them, but we should have learned them. Uh, the intervention in Somalia failed. We learned that when you've got a collapsed state, almost nothing can fix it. 20 years on, we're still trying to deal with Somalia, and we've, the only way we can think of dealing with it is deal it with it offshore. We deal with a piracy problem in, which affects vital interests, uh, but no one is going on shore to fix uh, Somalia. So we've learned very early, there, and that's a humbling lesson, there are some problems you can't fix out there. There isn't an intervention strategy that anybody's been able to develop for that country that anybody can, can believe. I think we're also still recovering morally, although this is a story most people have forgotten, from Rwanda. We're, we're still recovering um, our moral, the moral capital squandered in Rwanda, the discovery that, in fact, some lives mattered more than others the discovery that we had a normative commitment to the substantive moral equality of all individual persons, and when it came to it, we could watch 800,000 being, people being massacred in the space of eight weeks. And I think we paid a legitimacy price. Western democratic societies who signed up to human rights paid a legitimacy price in Rwanda, which we've still not recovered. Um, so doing nothing, you pay. Doing something, you may fail. I mean, all of the choices in intervention turn out to be tough. Uh, if we then move to a successful intervention in Bosnia in 1995, um, I think one of the, the reasons that I have enormous respect for, for Richard Holbrook is we forget the atmosphere of defeatism and fatalism prior to the Bosnian intervention. First of all, it was supposed to be the hour of Europe. I take no pleasure in reminding of you grinding this irony at the Europeans in the audience, but it was supposed to be the hour of Europe, and Europe failed, and because Europe failed, the United States had to step up. And we watched ethnic slaughter go on for 18 months, two, three years. We watched a European city being bombarded and civilians being picked off by snipers, and the shame grew and grew and grew, and finally, 
um, a headstrong, Machiavellian, devious, 24-7 uh, <laughs> sacred monster called Dick Holbrook got in there and began to put together uh, the combination of military power, diplomatic suasion that brought um, uh, a war to an end in south southern Europe. And in some ways, in as we look back at it now, we can see Dick Holbrook as as uh, General George Catlett Marshall's last heir. Seems to me the completion of the, uh, the American rebuilding of Europe after 45 starts with, with Roosevelt, Marshall, and Truman, and it is capped with uh, America stepping in because Europe couldn't complete its own uh, rebuilding. And it's worth remembering as we go further into some of these other examples of intervention that uh, let's remember the fatalism and hopelessness before we intervened in Rwanda, uh, in Bosnia. Uh, it sounds a lot like Syria to me. Nothing can be done, nothing will work, will only make things worse. All of that was heard in 1993, 1994 in the run up to the Bosnian case. And the fact of the matter is the use of force by the United States and its allies meant that to this day no one's dying in Bosnia. It's a very important result in an imperfect, dirty world. I don't need to tell you that the peace in Bosnia is as imperfect as it could be. It's not even necessarily stable, but neither in Bosnia or Kosovo is anybody uh, dying. So that's what we learned through, through the 1990s, and then we intervened in Kosovo, and at that moment, a fissure opened up between legality and legitimacy. You'll remember that Germany and Canada and NATO countries were prepared to uh, authorize the use of force without Security Council approval, and um, at that moment, this fissure opened up between what was perceived to be a morally legitimate intervention and use of force, but was nonetheless in international law illegal, and at that point, uh, Kofi Annan said, as it were, Houston, or Houston, we have a problem. I said that for you, Gary. Um, we have a problem, and how do we close that gap between legality and legitimacy? And at that point, the responsibility to protect commission, of which I was a part, was commissioned. An interesting example of norm entrepreneurship by a small country called Canada in conjunction with a... Um, an, uh, an American foundation, the MacArthur Foundation, and we put a new idea into circulation in the international arena, which was the idea that sovereigns, that sovereignty was not simply sovereignty as inviolability and control. Sovereignty also meant responsibility. We defined responsibility at the minimum level, which is to say a responsible sovereign does not massacre his own people. If a sovereign massacres his own people, he forfeits, at least temporarily, his right to be sovereign. And other states have a correlative responsibility to step in and stop the massacre. That was the responsibility to protect doctrine. It sought to do two things. It sought to reconceive sovereignty as responsibility as opposed to sovereignty as inviolability. And it also sought to say, and this was uh, a hidden conclusion that people uh, didn't see at the time, it sought to turn intervention from being a discretionary right into a responsibility, a, coerce, a, a, a peremptory obligation. Uh, the great powers, the NATO powers, immediately understood that sovereignty as responsibility was basically saying, we want to limit your discretion. We want to compel you normatively to intervene when... Um, when uh, populations are being massacred. I think it's fair to say that that's one of the evaluation questions over the, over the 20 years of intervention, is have we moved the public conception of sovereignty from sovereignty as inviolability to sovereignty as responsibility? Have we moved it a millimeter? I'd like to say, I would like to be standing here in memory of Richard Holbrook and say that we change customary international law and that now it is part of customary international law that sovereignty is understood as responsibility. But ladies and gentlemen, I don't think I can say that and remain an honest man. I'm not sure we've moved it a millimeter. 
it's still a good idea, but <coughs> sovereignty is inviolability, sovereignty is control, sovereignty is non-interference, is alive and well in the international order, and its chief defenders, needless to say, are Russia and China. And not just Russia and China, but every country with a difficult imperial past, every country with a memory of colonization and subjugation, every country with an imperial, imperial heritage they want to overcome. Sovereignty is responsibility, let's be very clear, has some friends in the German Foreign Office. It has a few <laughs> friends left in Canadian uh, Foreign Ministry, but it is a, an embattled idea in the modern world. The second thing that I think is equally embattled is the idea that intervention is a responsibility. I think it remains a discretionary right, and it remains a discretionary right for some good, difficult reasons that have to do with democratic legitimacy. States that are about to send their sons and daughters into harm's way have to have the right to decide whether this is, this is something they can persuasively do. They have to have reasonable prospects that that intervention will succeed, and uh, pressing them to make this a normative duty that peremptorily overrides their discretionary right to decide what they can persuade their public to do, just not going to happen. This is said to you as somebody who wrote most of this stuff. And you're, I'm, I'm telling you, what did I learn in 20 years? This is the kind of stuff I learned. Not happy, happy talk, but I think Richard Holbrook would agree with me that mm -hmm. it is better to be realistic about the status of moral universals as opposed to be pious and hopeful in defiance of the evidence. Um, so we then have some painful experiences after 9-11 with intervention. We have the catastrophe of Iraq, um, and we have the enormously difficult lessons of Afghanistan. And there's no question that that produces in the American public, I think, a very important set of conclusions, which are that um, I've been asked by my German colleagues this week, what is the grand strategic design of the Obama administration? And I keep saying it's to bring home every single combat troop from harm's way by the end of the second term. Um, I think this is an overwhelming strategic priority of this president for, for excellent democratic reasons. And I think one of the things that Obama is trying to say to the world is, I am the first genuinely post-imperial president in your history. And by that I mean not that the United States doesn't continue to have global uh, responsibilities, but I'm the first president who has to confront what used to be a matter of discussion, namely imperial overstretch, the fiscal limits of an imperial state, I'm the first one who has to own this problem, and I'm the first one who has to fix it. And I don't like the cards I've been dealt, but the cards I've been dealt on the fiscal side are peremptory. Um, and I think that combined with uh, the feeling that uh, America is not merely war-weary, but America is unconvinced by the history of intervention that we've lived through, um, is unconvinced that it wants to give this democratic consent means that, America, that Obama has very broadly based support for uh, a strategic goal, which is to take uh, the troops home by the end of 2016. And he will do so, I think, with enormous popular support in the United States and a good deal of support in the international community. But there's no good thing without a price. And the, if America makes that the overwhelming strategic goal of its foreign policy, it leaves a very considerable strategic hole where America used to be. You either rejoice at that and think that's terrific news, or you begin scratching your head a bit. And one of the places you begin scratching your head, needless to say, is Syria. Uh, Syria is where the moment of truth arrives. Um, if Obama's overwhelming strategic objective is to get troops out of harm's way and do some nation building at home, and if that's what a democratic foreign policy, by democratic I mean small d, what a democratic foreign policy really means, then it leaves an enormous strategic hole in the middle of the Middle East. Um, and in that vacuum, 70,000 civilians are dying. And a civil war which has gone on for two years could burn for quite a long time to come uh, with incalculable effects 
on the long-term cohesion of Syria as a state and long-term strategic consequences for Israel, uh, for Lebanon, for Jordan, uh, for the entire state order created by Mr. Sykes and Mr. Pico after Versailles. I mean, we may be looking long-term at the disintegration of the post-Versailles state order in the Middle East. And if the United States withdraws from um, its uh, uh, supervisory and manipulative and interfering role in that, in that strategic vacuum, other forces will emerge and begin to drive it. And it's not obvious to me that that is going to be without uh, consequences for the people we care about, which are the hard-pressed civilians and, and ordinary people in that uh, part of the world. Um, what is, I think, also uh, very important to say about an American strategic goal, which is to get your troops out of harm's way, which is a goal that, as a democratic citizen, I strongly support, is that it's produced a contraction of strategic imagination in American policy circles. What strikes me very formidably is how constricted our strategic thinking is about a place like Syria. The trick with Syria is to integrate Iran, Lebanon, Jordan, Israel, the whole arc of fire that runs from Morocco on the Atlantic coast right through to Pakistan and see that hugely important region of the world as a whole and figure out how Western powers, the Arab states, the Arab street begin to move that whole part of the world into away from the abyss and towards what I can only call responsible government. That is, some forms of government that are accountable to their people. That seems to be what we want normatively. Um, but very few people are addressing the, this strategic panorama of this arc of conflict from North Africa through to, through to Pakistan, and certainly not uh, the United States. We've, our strategic imagination is narrowed to this problem, then this problem, then this problem, with none of what strategic linkage requires, which is how does this stuff uh, in, interact. We are currently, just to deal with that issue, um, looking at the possibility of a peace conference with, um, uh, with the Russians and the Americans. I would say there's a 5 to 15 percent chance that it might succeed, but it's extremely important in my view that it does, since the alternative is a long, drawn-out civil war in which the body count rises from 70,000 to 100 to 150,000. Um, the conditions for success of that peace conference, it seems to me, are austere in the extreme. Uh, we're dealing, as I said, in a new world in which we have global free riders and global spoilers who are s very strongly attached to sovereignty as control and sovereignty as inviolability, and whose foreign policy in the last two and a half years has been to look at the United States and stick two fingers in their eye. And the question then becomes whether Putin wants to have more of a foreign policy than that and make himself part of the solution in Syria or continue to be uh, 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 obstruct any resolution, and we're in the weeks in which that strategic choice by Russia is about to be made, and it doesn't take much strategic imagination to see why Russia might want to do a deal, provided the Americans were prepared to guarantee that the army survives, the bases in the Mediterranean survives, the Ba'athist structure of the regime survives, and you transition the top of that uh, administration out to a dacha in Moscow, and you can see how that might be in Russian strategic interest. But uh, as we come up to the 100th anniversary of World War I, we all know that what is in a rational actor's strategic interest is very rarely what a rational actor actually does historically. So we have no guarantees that the Russians will act to work with the the Americans. You can just see an American-Russian uh, 
strategic partnership in which Russia agrees to pass a message from the United States, which is to Bashar Assad, if you don't show up at this conference and negotiate seriously, we'll take out your air airfields. That is, America will take out your airfields. Um, it may need some military pressure uh, to force um, Assad to the table. That seems to me an important lesson about intervention. Uh, military means separated from a political and diplomatic strategy are, are almost always unsuccessful. They only work, this is what Holbrook understood, you've got to gear the two together. Credible threats of military force, political strategies, diplomatic negotiation. You've got to put them together in a strategy that works. What is frightening about Syria is, in fact, I think Bashir Assad looks out, out, of, his, um, out of his trench and thinks he's going to win. And because he thinks he's got to win, I don't see him having strong enough uh, motives uh, to settle. And so we may be looking at a civil war that ends with the uh, ultimate destruction of the Syrian state order or the reimposition of Ba'athist tyranny over a population that's withdrawn its consent. And this is, I think, what you get in a strategic vacuum in which the United States prioritizes withdrawal uh, from international engagement rather than um, uh, continuing uh, to attempt to structure the future of this region. Um, so that's where we are after 20 years. We've had some interventions that worked. We've got some sovereigns who've had some, so some sobering wake-up calls about the limits of their own sovereignty. We've got the sovereigns that have military capability and the capacity for geostrategic thinking and outreach largely uh, diverted to managing um, problems of sovereign legitimacy and fiscal uh, readjustment at home. Uh, the world is in some curious way deglobalizing. The world is looking inwards to deal with the democratic sovereignty problems at home. And that, it seems to me, creates a strategic vis uh, a vacuum that someone like Richard Holbrook would have seen and denounced. Uh, it is a time for uh, strategic vision, and uh, I will conclude with a tiny bit of purely uh, normative um, strategic utopianism of my own. I mean, it, when I when I talk to my students at Harvard and they ask me, you know, Professor Ignatieff, you're so depressing and your <laughs> news is so bad and you keep telling us it's getting worse and worse. Could you give us a hopeful message? And I, I find myself as someone who's been in democratic politics coming out with a passionate belief in the importance of legitimate political institutions that command the support of their citizens. Um, and I come out looking at a world that is sundered by violence and ethnic strife. If you ask me what my utopia is, it's a utopia of responsible sovereigns, a world in which sovereigns are accountable to their people, sovereigns who deliver mastery of your own house to their people, Sovereigns who control violence within their territory, re-secure the monopoly of violence over their territory. Imagine what it's like to live in Mexico. Imagine what it's like to live in Colombia. Imagine what it's like to live in 30 or 40 countries in the world. Their primary human need, the primary, even the primary condition for any human rights observance at all is sovereign order. Um, and so as I get older, I put more and more emphasis on uh, the need to reestablish uh, the Berrien sovereignty wherever we can and move us towards a world where um, we have sovereigns who are fiscally responsible, who pay their way, who don't borrow more than they can repay, who don't export moral hazard to stronger sovereigns. That's been a shock for the European system to see the ways in which Weak sovereigns, the tails of weak sovereigns can wag pretty big dogs, and that's been a shock. You want to have a, you want to have a European order 
which reestablishes and reaffirms uh, sovereign responsibility for fiscal, uh, fiscal uh, policy, uh, basic welfare provision, uh, basic in employment. And it, it's a sovereignist vision that would urge you all to be a little skeptical of that. One of the words that stops thought in international politics for me is the word governance. I never understood what the word governance is because I can't correlate it to anything responsible. I don't know who's responsible for governance. I know what government is. Government, as I understand it, is government that is in some degree, even in non-democratic systems, accountable and responsible to a determinate population. That I understand. Governance, I'm not sure I do. So in a, a utopia of responsible sovereigns, we have a lot of inter-sovereign cooperation to deal with the externalities of sovereignty. There are lots of parts of the world where sovereigns are exporting their problem. There are lots of problems like climate change which sovereigns need to deal with as externalities of their own authority. But I come out of 20 years of intervention um, uh, convinced that the goal of intervention itself is to restore sovereignty mastery in your own house to people who can't do it for themselves and then leave them to be masters in their own house and make their own choices. Uh, and that's about as hopeful as I can get for my students and it's about as hopeful as I can get for you, but I hope we'll have a discussion and I hope you'll disagree with every single word you just heard. <laughs>